All right, good morning to all of you. Yeah, very sorry for the delay, you know, for those of you who are online. Uh, there have been some glitches, uh, but yeah, it's fixed now. Everything should be fine. Uh, so we'll begin. Last class, we looked at the doctrine of Christ, and we looked a little bit at the work of atonement which Christ has done. Uh, so the idea was that that would lead us into today's topic which would be the doctrine of salvation and justification. So that's the class that we are um, covering today, uh, the topic of salvation and justification. Now, what do we mean? Uh, different people think of salvation differently, depending on their religious background. For some, that word salvation may mean some kind of enlightenment. You know, they meditate and they fast and then some kind of enlightenment, enlightenment comes upon them and then they call that salvation. Uh, for some people, salvation may be um, breaking free from the cycle of uh, birth and death. And for many Christians, the word salvation seems to mean a free ticket to heaven without having to do anything to earn it. So different people think of salvation differently. But what does the Bible say? How does the Bible define salvation? That's what we will look at now. Um, if we could have someone open up for us Romans chapter 6, verse 18 and read it out, um, either online or here in the class, Romans 6, 18. Romans chapter 6, verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So salvation is, first of all, deliverance from the slavery to sin. It's not talking over here about free tickets. It's talking about something much more valuable. Salvation is being delivered, being set free from slavery to sin. And salvation is also one more, uh, one more uh, thing, second thing. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 to 19, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 18 to 19. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So the second thing which salvation is, is that, you see, because of what Christ did on the cross, it says in um, 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says that now because of what Christ has done, God does not count people's sins against them anymore. So now he no longer considers us as sinners. We have been uh, covered by the sacrifice of Jesus. So now he wants to reconcile us with himself. Whereas earlier he used to regard us as uh, enemies because we were in sin. Now we are no longer enemies. Now we are his friends. And so now there is a personal relationship possible between God and us. So salvation is not about a free ticket to heaven. Salvation is deliverance from slavery to sin. And even as you're getting delivered from slavery to sin, you are now entering into something new. You are entering into a personal relationship with this God who wants to reconcile us with himself. So there are two things involved in salvation and we need to grasp this because all of us, we are, you know, believers and the commission that God has given us is that we should go and share the gospel with people. So we should not be sharing some kind of a diluted, meaningless gospel. We should be talking about what salvation is actually all about according to the Bible. So we need to tell people the salvation that I am preaching to you is not about a free ticket to heaven. It is about deliverance from bondage to sin. It is deliverance from slavery to sin. And God is delivering you from sin 
from slavery to sin because he wants you to enter into a personal relationship with him that is what salvation is about you know because um, if you were to go to the mall and you know you have uh, some of these uh, attendants standing over there and they're giving out let us say free sachets of shampoo you know some new brand of shampoo and they're giving out free sachets anyone can walk up to them you know you ask you say give me one of the one of the uh, shampoo sachets sample sachets you know they would just hand it over to you no obligation involved you don't have to be you know um, praise their company you don't have to you know uh, make an allegiance and say oh from now on i will only buy your products nothing no obligations involved it's free you walk up to them they give you the sachet you take it you go after you go home if you want to go and use another other brand of shampoo no props no loyalty needed people tend to think of salvation like that salvation is not a free ticket to heaven you don't just walk up to god and say oh give me my free ticket lord and then walk away and do whatever you want with yourself that is not the biblical definition of salvation salvation involves loyalty an allegiance that you are now making to this god who has you know sent his son and sacrificed his son on your behalf this loyalty involved this commitment involved it is free you know you don't have to pay anything for it but it it involves commitment lifetime commitment so we are delivered from slavery to sin so that we can no longer so that so that we would no longer continue to be slaves to sin but now we choose to be slaves of righteousness we choose to enter into a personal relationship with this god and uh, you know live a righteous life that is why in romans 6:18 which we read out just now it says why have you been set free from sin you have been set free from sin so that you can become slaves to righteousness so you still have a commitment to someone earlier your commitment was to the world and to sin but now your commitment is to the lord and it is to righteousness so um, it is a free gift but it involves loyalty and commitment um so when we talk about salvation there are basically three maybe three stages i would not say you know stages to get saved but three stages in the entire process of salvation uh we have the initial salvation experience that happens when we you know place our faith in the lord jesus and we say lord i am repenting of my sins now from now on lord i commit to live for you to follow you you give me this new life which you have promised so in that moment of salvation uh, you know you come into the family of god so now that is your initial salvation experience but then there's a continued salvation experience which we go through for the rest of our earthly life where we are undergoing a process of cleaning cleansing sanctification where on a daily basis we are choosing to cooperate with the lord and become slaves of righteousness so on a daily basis we say no to the temptations of the world we say no to uh, to uh, to sin and satan and we say yes to the lord so that is called the process of sanctification so you have the first stage of initial salvation experience you also have the second stage of continued sanctification which happens throughout our entire lifetime and then the final stage will happen in heaven when we get there that would be glorification where we are glorified where one day we will receive our resurrected bodies where one day we will be just like christ you know the same way he has a resurrected body we also will have resurrected bodies so uh process uh, this process of salvation uh goes on for over a lifetime you know you have the initial salvation experience then you continue to go through sanctification every day for the rest of your life and when you get into heaven when you see him you will be like him you know you will experience glorification at that point of time so um, basically we say that the uh, salvation we experience it in three stages in three phases now let's you know dive into this topic of salvation let's look at some important uh, verses regarding this um, and uh, uh, maybe this is one class where we really should pay attention because 
Jesus said to us, go into all the world and proclaim, you know, uh, the gospel and make disciples. So this is the gospel that we should be talking about. Okay, so uh, John chapter 16, verse 8, which talks about this whole salvation experience, which, which the Holy Spirit initiates. How does the Holy Spirit in initiate the salvation experience for each person? Uh, that is explained in John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. John 16, 8 to 11, if someone could read out. John, and John when he had come. Uh, yeah, the person on that. Yeah. John chapter and 16, has... verse 8 to 11. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you cannot see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Um, you know, this is a very familiar passage. Everyone knows it, but not many understand it. They don't really know what exactly the Holy Spirit is supposed to be convicting people of. Um, uh, in the NIV, this is how it puts it. In NIV, it says, when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about three things. The Holy Spirit, in what way will he convict? He will convict the people and prove to them that they are wrong about three things. Because the people of the world are under the impression sin is something, you know, if something very, um, if you do something very terrible, then you would call that sin. For instance, if I were to go and stab somebody, that would be a sin. On the other hand, you know, if I'm just simply um, living a normal average life, they would say, oh, I'm not living a sinful life. So they have a wrong idea about sin. So the first thing which the Holy Spirit convicts people about is that if you do not believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, it is sin. Because that's what it says over here about sin because people do not believe in me. So the first thing which the Holy Spirit convicts people of, that if they have not believed Jesus as being the only way to the Father, it is automatically sin. You are automatically a sinner. The only way you will come from that sinner stage into the you know saved believer stage is if you believe in this Jesus and accept that he is the only way to the Father. So that's the first fundamental thing which the Holy Spirit convicts people of. The second thing which the Holy Spirit convicts people about is about uh, righteousness. So people have the idea that if they do a lot of good deeds, if they give money to the you know uh, churches and temples and mosques, if they give uh, food to the poor, if they do these things, then they will be declared righteous is what they think. But what scripture teaches is that um, uh, here in verse 10, it says about righteousness, because I am going to the father where you can see me no longer. Jesus is basically saying, I will go to the father carrying my sacrificial blood. And when I do that, God will accept it as a acceptable atoning sacrifice. And so, the people's sins will be forgiven, and whoever believes in me, they will be declared as, uh, you know, uh, as atoned for. They will be declared as being saved. So righteousness is not going to be attained by doing good works. So the second thing which the Holy Spirit convicts people of is that, however, however many good works you may do, it is not enough. It is not sufficient. You have to place your belief in this Jesus because he is, takes his sacrificial blood into the father's presence and god the father accepts that sacrifice alone as being enough to wipe away your sins and declare you righteous so this is the second thing which the holy spirit convicts people about the third thing which the holy spirit convicts people about is regarding judgment uh, so in verse 11 it says and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So why did uh, uh, Jesus come into this world? To fight Satan on our behalf and to gain victory on our behalf. So Jesus, um, you know, uh, became sin for us 
he sacrificed himself for us but uh, sin could not hold him down because he personally had never committed any sin so sin could not hold him death could not hold him he did that sacrifice on our behalf but sin could not hold him down the way it used to hold us down so he was able to defeat satan and declare victory for all of us so uh, satan now stands condemned anyone who chooses to continue living in satan's slavery will join him in hell in the same way satan has been has been declared condemned anyone who chooses to continue staying under satan under the under the control of the spirit of the air is how it says in you know in one of the epistles so anyone who chooses to continue staying under the rule of satan will be condemned along with him so the holy spirit convicts people about judgment that if they choose to stay in the kingdom of darkness they will you know end up in hell condemned the same way the prince of the air is going to stand condemned uh, so so these are the three things that the holy spirit convicts people of but there's a there's a vital um, another point attached to this let's look at romans chapter 10 verse 14 romans 10 14 if someone could read out romans 10 verse 14 how then can they call on the one they have not believed in and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them no exactly no i mean such a practical uh, point uh, of course you know in romans 10 14 i mean the context is slightly different but look at the words i mean uh, that are being spoken over here very very practical point unless someone tells them about these things how will they even know unless someone goes and preaches these things to them how will the holy spirit convict them if someone is standing over there and faithfully you know conveying this true gospel message to the people then the holy spirit can do his work of conviction inside them on the other hand if the basic evangelist stands over there and says come to jesus all your problems will be solved come to jesus and your sicknesses will be healed what the evangelist is saying is true very very true jesus does help us in our trials and difficulties he does heal us from our sicknesses but if that is all you are going to be saying and then you tell if you come to this come to jesus he will heal you and he will take you to heaven will anybody say no of course everyone wants that free offer but salvation is not like a free sachet there's a commitment involved there are spiritual principles involved people need to find understand that jesus is the only way to heaven they need to understand that righteousness is all, is going to be acquired only by placing their faith in him and submitting their life to him people need to know that if they continue living the way they do and just simply you know bow down to jesus once in a while they are still under judgment and in the same way satan is going to be judged one day they too will be judged these are important vital things which the evangelist should be sharing with the people if he doesn't even share these facts with the people how will the holy spirit do his work on the inside and convict the people of these things because even as the you know even even as that humble evangelist is just standing over there using ordinary words and expressing these things in detail the holy spirit will divinely do his work inside people's hearts and convict them and help them to realize that what they had been thinking so far you know is all wrong and this is the truth it's high time that we you know in the christian community start preaching the true gospel of god the complete salvation message of god we we are promoting jesus the way people promote products you know the way people promote uh, cameras and shoes and clothes this is not just something you know we say oh you know jesus is this wonderful brand you come to jesus all your problems are taken care of no we are talking about people being delivered from slavery to sin and entering into a personal relationship with jesus that is what salvation is offering and if people don't realize that they'll think oh i just have to you know um, add jesus to my collection of gods and uh, yeah he'll take care of my eternity no so you see it's it's very serious thing 
so we need to preach the true gospel so that the holy spirit can do his work of conviction um on the inside even as we are sharing with people um ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 another important principle regarding salvation ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 9 for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not for yourself it is the gift of god not by the works so that no one can boast yeah so if a person let us say is sitting in um in a gospel meeting and the preacher is preaching about salvation even as the per person on the stage is preaching the holy spirit convicts this person on the inside helps them to understand that what is being told is the truth he opens up the mind of the person and helps him to understand the things which are being told the person may not understand all the details properly but the holy spirit who is working on the inside of that person helps them to understand that whatever is being said is true and they need to accept it so anyone who becomes open to what the holy spirit is doing inside and they are being and they start to respond to such people the holy spirit gives them this beautiful gift of faith so that they can take that final step and open their mouth and say yes lord i believe in you i believe you are the only way to the father i believe that your the sacrifice which you have done is sufficient to uh, to cleanse all my sins and yes lord i want to follow you so the holy spirit gives that person that gift of faith and then that person is able to open their mouth and confess jesus and accept him so um no person can boast and say i had such great faith that you know what i was able to believe in jesus nobody from my family accepted but i had the faith required to believe in jesus no one can boast that because that gift of faith is given by the holy spirit himself only god can give you that gift so that is why it says in ephesians 2:8 to 9 for it is by grace you have been saved this is not something that you achieved on your own it's a free thing which was given to you in fact it says even that faith which you had to place in jesus that didn't come from your uh, from your own self it is the holy spirit who helped you to believe so the holy spirit will do his work and what he wants us from us is that we should partner with him faithfully instead of preaching diluted salvation messages in which the salvation gospel is not even real you know made clear if we can sincerely do our little part the holy spirit will do the rest of it he will convict the people of sin righteousness and judgment he is the one who will give them the gift of faith that they need to confess jesus he will bring them into a true relationship with him where they actually have been delivered from the from the bondage to uh, to bondage and slavery to sin and have actually entered into a relationship with god sadly today we have a lot of fake christians who think that they have become christians just because they said a salvation prayer or just because they got healed they think that they are saved but they are not saved because they never even they nobody even told them the true gospel message so we who know the truth must share it sincerely and even as we are doing our part and partnering with the lord the lord will do his part he will save the people it's something that we can never do on our own our part is to faithfully share the gospel the way the the, the evangelists and preachers of the early church did paul says you know he in fact boasts about it he says you know all these greek philosophers they use big sounding words they use fine fine sounding words he says this to the corinthian believers he says they use all kinds of big words to convince you but i have decided i'm going to preach only the cross of christ and nothing else so that simple message if we can deliver it in a sincere way and do our part the holy spirit will do his part and bring people into the kingdom and they will be genuine believers so they will genuinely start living in victory they will genuinely have a passion to go and start sharing about jesus with others instead of having a whole bunch of fake christians who are warming the seats because they don't even know what the actual salvation message is yes, so we need to do our part sincerely so 
we have talked a little bit about what salvation is not. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 11, 20 to 30. Um, it's actually a very, very familiar passage. This is the passage, you know, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are you know, weary and uh, um, heavy laden. So this is the passage where Jesus talks about that. And many don't realize this is Jesus' formal salvation invitation to the people. So if, you know, if Jesus were giving a salvation message, this is basically how he would give it. Matthew so um, uh, we, uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, we, we don't, you know, we, we won't read the entire thing. Uh, but just for us to get a clearer context, verse 20 would give us a clearer picture. Because you see in verse 20 onwards, Jesus begins to denounce the towns which have refused to believe in his miracles and repent of their sins. So he says, you know, I have done so many miracles among these people. In spite of seeing all of these miracles, these people are still not believing in me and they're still not repenting of their sins. So he criticizes them. He condemns them for not repenting. And he says the judgment against them will be very, very great. Because in the Old Testament times, the people did not get to see the miracles of Jesus. You know, so maybe they, uh, the judgment upon them will be lesser. But these people who with their own eyes have seen dead people being raised, who have seen blind people actually getting, their, getting back their sight in a moment, who have seen such things and are still refusing to repent of their sins. You know, Jesus condemns them and he speaks against them. He says that the judgment against them will be very, very great. And then in that same context, he comes to these words which we are so familiar with. So if we could have someone read out verses 28 to 30, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there are three main things that we see over here. First, Jesus is saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So you've been trying to live life in your own way. You've been trying to do the best that you can do. But you know that you are sinful. You know that whatever you're achieving will have some benefits here on the earth. But what about your eternity? What about your future? So you who have been trying so hard to live in your own way and you have not succeeded, Jesus says, come to me. And I will show you a new way of life, not on, which will not only have benefits for you down here on this earth, but which will have benefits for you eternally. So Jesus' invitation is to everyone who is tired of trying to live in the way the world is living and not being able to achieve that peace, that joy, that contentment, that victory over sinfulness. You know, anyone who's tired and fed up of trying so hard and not being able to achieve those things, Jesus is saying to them, come to me. I can show you a new way of life. And then you will actually feel rest. You will find deep rest and contentment for your souls. That's the salvation invitation which he gives to them. What's the second thing which he says? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So if you want to enjoy this rest, if you want to enjoy this new way of living, then there's only one way. You have to take my yoke upon you and start learning from me. You know, uh, you can't just go back to your old way of life. That will not give you the rest for your soul, which you are you know, seeking. You have to take up my yoke upon you and start learning from me. There's no shortcut. You have to take up my yoke and start learning from me. But he gives an assurance, something very beautiful. He says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. So don't be scared. I'm not a very tough teacher. I'm not, I'm not a very strict teacher. I know you. I know your weaknesses. I know your limitations. So I'm gentle and humble in spirit. And I will teach you in a way that you will be able to handle. And I will help you to grow. And you will be able to start enjoying this new life that I am you know, leading you into. So that is the second part of the salvation message where he says, you've got to take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There is no other shortcut. 
but i'll be there i'm gentle and humble and i will help you to learn and you will be able to start enjoying this new life that you know that i'm giving so he says the third portion he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light because it's the it's it's through the power of the holy spirit that we live this christian life on our own it's impossible i mean can we ever forgive anybody on our own it's by the power of the holy spirit that we forgive can we ever you know sacrificially love anyone and help them no i mean it's through the power of the holy spirit that he enables us to you know uh, love generously and help generously so jesus is saying my demands are very very high but it's a easy yoke it's a light burden because i will enable you my holy spirit will enable you it will not happen by might or by power but by my spirit you will be able to lead victorious lives so that's the assurance that he gives now this is not a very um not a very good advertisement you know when it comes to you know uh, promoting brands but this is a simple salvation message which is you know offering rest to people who are hungry people who are tired people who have been trying so hard and they have not succeeded so this is what jesus is offering people so if you notice one of the key factors mentioned over here is that the person has to take up jesus yoke and start learning from him you know jesus i know um uh, it, it, he mentions it in a different way uh, in the gospels for instance luke 9 23 if someone could read out luke 9:23 luke chapter 9 luke 9:23 you can and read. he said to all if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me could you just read out that once more just once more yeah same thing and he said to all if any one would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me yes so uh, uh, in that version you know it says let him take up his cross and follow me you know niv is rather plain about it it says who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross no shortcut you got to take up his yoke you got to take up his cross not just once a month not just on sundays this daily every single day you got to take up your cross you got to take up the yoke which i am giving and you no know, follow me sacrificing whatever needs to be sacrificed you know obeying and submitting regarding whatever i'm asking you to do so if you do that then such people alone will be my disciples so this is very very different from you know going to the mall and collecting a free sachet very different all right so um uh, just for us to give one final point to this thought you know which we have been going through up to now um matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 14 that's a parable about the king who throws a banquet for um the guests so he first of all you know we are very familiar with that story Uh, so if you were to go to matthew 22 was 1 to 14 uh, the king is inviting all the vips you know the people who uh, are the special chosen ones he invites them he gives them special invitations to the banquet um, but the vips are not interested in coming so they all make excuses in fact they make very lame excuses for why they can't come okay so they all back out and then the king says no props the vip is not interested i will open the invitation to everybody you know and he says gather all the people that you can find on the roads tell them the invitation is open and they can come for the banquet and then he says you know if if enough people have not come go go even into the side roads you know where you'll probably have the outcasts you know the beggars the really poor the ones who can't be in the main uh, highways in the main um, uh, you know the main roads uh, so go you may go even in, even into those remote places you know bring even those people give the invitation even to them so the invitation is now open to everyone the qualification is the, is not that you should be good only then you can come you can be good or bad you can be uh, a thief or you can be a good person you can be whatever 
everyone is invited the invitation is open now to everybody now we know how do we i mean uh, what is the meaning that jesus was trying to bring out he was basically saying that i have come to the jewish people first but the jewish people are rejecting me they are saying that they do not want to believe in me so no problem i'll open it up to the gentiles okay that's so that's the you know meaning which jesus tries to bring out from the parable uh, the point is that you can be any kind of a gentile you can be a good gentile a bad gentile invitation is open to everybody and then when people come over there there's only one condition being laid on them please wear the wedding robe because you can't uh, you know be in this banquet in the condition that you are in you got to i mean you might have been the most rotten person on earth no problem but now that you have come here time to change your clothes okay so now you will have to put on, put on the wedding robe so it doesn't matter what your past has been you know you may be you may have been the a murderer no problem you are also invited but once you come to the banquet one condition you got to wear the wedding robe you got to give up whatever that life you had before give it up wear the wedding robe and you have one guy who comes over there to the banquet and he chooses not to wear the wedding robe so what happens to him maybe we can read out those particular verses matthew 22 13 and 14 Matthew twenty two thirteen and fourteen. Then the king. Then the king said, told the attendants. Ah, uh, can I read from uh, verse thirteen or from verse twelve, ma'am? Um, all right. If you want to read from twelve, that's fine. Matthew twenty two twelve to fourteen. Sure. Okay. Let me go from verse eleven. So it's a full thing. Oh, verse eleven. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed the man where he. who was not wearing wedding clothes friend he asked how did you get in here without wedding clothes the man was speechless then the king told the attendants tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth for many were invited but few are chosen okay many are invited the invitation is open to everyone no matter how rotten you are invitation is open to everyone but there's a condition attached you fulfill that you know you're in if you refuse to fulfill that condition you are out uh, so uh, in in the in the parable uh, the uh, king in fact says to that person in a very friendly way he says friend how did you get in here without the wedding robe and it says the man was speechless he could not come up with any excuses so that's the point jesus christ has done made the ultimate sacrifice he's made the way to the father and you don't have to pay anything you know to 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 enjoy this to be to be delivered from the slavery to sin and to have a personal relationship with the king of kings you don't have to pay anything you don't have to earn uh, uh, you don't have to put in any effort and earn that privilege it's free but you got to be willing to take up his yoke because that's the only way you're going to enjoy the rest which he's offering the whole point of offering salvation to people is 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 so that they can have rest and if you do want that rest then you know it's it's something that you're consciously choosing from your side to reject so uh, in the same way this person was thrown out of the wedding banquet um jesus uses that parable to indirectly tell this jewish people you know what you're doing is very dangerous you think that by rejecting me you you know you're holding on to your high status you think that oh i'm i'm a, i'm a, i'm a person from galilee whereas you people are all from jerusalem a highly educated uh, seminary people so you may be thinking that but jesus is saying what you're doing is very dangerous you know you uh, by rejecting this invitation what you're doing is uh, you're harming your eternity is what jesus wants to bring out through that uh, parable so we have seen that um true conversion an actual true uh, salvation experience will involve two things it does involve faith in jesus christ but it also involves repentance so there are two things which are absolutely necessary for you to have a true salvation experience you must have faith in jesus but you must also repent let's look at the first point you know uh, faith in jesus because a lot of teachings are going around on youtube 
you know uh, people of different religions they talk about how you need to be mindful about the way you live they talk about how you need to cleanse your spirit and think clean good thoughts they talk about how you need to give up uh, uh, corruption and put other people's interests first they're, they're talking about very nice things so there are there are many nice ways in which you can repent but all those nice ways of repenting are not pointing towards christ they're just saying you know improve yourself live a better life you know enjoy the benefits of uh, of of, be, of of this world by being a better person so all kinds of repentance are being preached but only one repentance will work the repentance which points in the direction of christ you so repenting is not enough you have to repent and then place your faith in jesus alone only then the repentance is complete simply repenting and going and sitting in the himalayas and meditating will not help simply you know repenting and going and you know giving all your money you know and uh, to the poor will not help so repenting is a nice thing but it's only half you got to repent and put your faith in jesus then the uh, the you know salvation is uh, complete so um, how do you put your faith in jesus uh, two things first you have to believe the facts about jesus okay it's 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 it's, it's as simple as that so in john 14:6 jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me so you got to accept the fact that jesus has died on the cross for us you got to accept the fact that if you place your faith in him he will take you to the father so you accept the facts so um faith when it comes to believing in the facts but also there's another aspect to faith this is a more personal aspect of faith where you're saying lord now i'm completely placing my life in your hands till now i lived in my own way but now i'm trusting you enough that i'm putting my entire life in your hands i'm going to take up your cross and start following you please lord you know don't destroy my life you know make my life bless me you know so you come with that simple trust and you're scared you're thinking oh my i have to give up so many things how will i give up those things how will i live how will i manage but in spite of all your doubts you know you're saying lord you're trustworthy if you died on the cross for me definitely i can trust you so lord even though what you're asking of me is difficult you're saying that i will have to you know take up my cross and follow you every day but you said that you're gentle and humble in spirit so lord i'm just trusting you my entire life all my hopes and dreams everything i'm placing it now in your hands lord so this is a personal aspect to faith you know like you know we covered in the other classes the demons also believe in jesus they believe that he is the son of god they have no doubt in their mind about it so they believe the facts but they don't believe and trust him to the extent where they were willing to place themselves under him you know they chose to rebel against him in the heavens so um, faith involves two things simply intellectually believing things about what is said in the bible is good but not enough faith also involves us placing ourselves in his hands completely trusting him to that extent and saying okay from now on i will not live my way i will live your way so just repenting of your sins is not enough we choose to also make this very personal faith commitment in jesus that is important so um what do we mean when we say you know repent uh, because jesus went from town to town saying repent because the kingdom of god is near because the kingdom of god is at hand so what did he mean when he was telling people to repent um it does mean of course you know us turning away from our old uh, way of life um let's look at matthew chapter mm. okay uh, basically we can just say that repentance is a godly sorrow i have put on that verse somewhere but not here okay we'll get to it, get to it later then all right fine uh yeah for for now let's you know it's enough for us to know that repentance is a godly sorrow about the way you have lived so far you know you're ashamed of the way you have lived so far you admit that whatever you have done is sinful in god's eyes 
you may not have murdered anyone you may you might not have uh, you know robbed a bank you might not have committed adultery you might not have done those things but whatever you have done you are convicted of it and now you genuinely feel ashamed about it you genuinely have a godly sorrow about it and you think oh i wish i had not lived in that way so repentance will involve a godly sorrow because what happens is this this idea that repentance is you know crying a lot because this happens uh, sometimes in our gospel meetings people sit over there and they cry they get very emotional they cry a lot and the next day they are back to their old ways so just simply emotion alone is not going to help there has to be a godly sorrow that oh i have lived in such a terrible way from now on i choose to give up this lord help me i don't want to go back to this anymore so there has to be a godly sorrow and a real alteration on the inside where you're saying i really don't want to go back to that horrible way of life lord now on lord i want to follow you help me i'm reaching out to you be my savior and he will be your savior so repentance is not just getting emotional and crying a lot repentance true repentance is where something happens on the inside where you decide enough is enough no more of the old life from now on lord i choose to follow you that would be true repentance so uh, you know we are kind of looking at what salvation actually involves okay so um, we are looking at different aspects of that so um, we will go on next to talk about the new birth uh, we have already spoken uh, about it to, to an extent you know in our uh, doctrine of humanity class so uh, it will be easier for us to grasp those things so we will do that after we come back from the break right thank you